Amen. Remain standing for our opening hymn. Come, Christians, join the saints. Words of prayer and bulletin. Us. And lead us not into temptation, but 
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. and has made us to be a kingdom of priests to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is, and who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Before I get started, I got a note handed to me. Ladies, there is no lunch on this Saturday. All right, I just want to let you know it's been canceled. So that's there. Joy and I have a, I don't know how you are, but I, I get excited because we have one of those uh, smart TVs, you know what I'm talking about. One that you can push on it and say what you want and it comes up. I would heard about a movie that was involved of uh, Stephen Hawking. I don't know if y'all remember him or not, but it was the story of his life, sort of a biopic of his. And it's called, uh, and so I said it, the name of it and it came up and we watched it. It was an interesting movie, all of that. But I got to thinking about it. most of us today, how many of you, when you wash clothes and get them out of the dryer, find out that there's a sock missing? Where does it go? Everybody has a theory about what happens to that second sock, and it's gone, it disappears from the wall. But as I got to thinking about that theory, that's what Stephen Hawking was about, was theories. He was a, a theorist. He was a, a theoretical physicist that he had a lot of thoughts in his mind, and if you really know, he had... Uh, uh, ALS like uh, Lou Gehrig did, but he lived a long, long time in his. 
And, but he was a brilliant ind individual, a brilliant physicist, and he had this theory of theory of everything, right? Uh, and so when you think about that, perhaps because the way the movie was about, they didn't go into much of his of his theory because we'd have been lost. We would have not understood a thing he was talking about because one of the excerpts in the movie as Joy and I were watching it was this interesting exchange for him and his wife at, at the time, uh, Jane. And he asked, and he she asked him because she was very devout and he wasn't. And so she asked him, you know, she said, what about you? And Stephen replied, she said, what are you? And he replied and says, I'm a cosmologist, not a cosmetologist, but a cosmologist, all right? And she said, what is that? What is a cosmologist? And he says, uh, it's a kind of a religion for intellectual, intellectual atheists. And I thought that was an interesting way of putting it there. But what if you look at the thing, what he was all about, and as you heard the scripture read there today and listening to it, there's a theory of everything. And that's where he was thinking about, because he wanted to time travel. He thought of those kind of things and wanted to do it because he said things like time travel and what he wanted to do with time travel, uh, the theory he had about it. But Many of us have thoughts about theories and theories about things in our lives. And one of the big questions is, are we alone in the universe? I'm seeing a lot as I look at uh, my astronomy emails and things I get and some, some of the websites I go on because I enjoy, as you well know, the stars and what's there. And they keep talking about, well, we have found another place all of these millions and millions of light years away that's very much like Earth. And I think, well, okay. But are we alone in this universe? No. Or what makes us human? That's another question we ask ourselves a lot. And, why don't, and another one is, why do we behave so badly at times? All right? I, I don't know how you are, but a lot of times I second guess myself and I go home and I think, I sure wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> You know, those kind of things we have in our life. You know, why do we do, why do bad things happen in life? And we think of those. How long will COVID last? We're still in the midst of it. And that's a question we have and we have there. Or is there a cure for cancer? Well, some people have had marvelous luck with this. And so we keep asking for that. And then the other one is, and I don't know that I want to do it, but that is, is time travel possible? You know, I, I, I don't think we can be like, say, beam me up, Scotty, because we can't get into that part of the world. But, you know, when we think about time, what is, what is the nature of time? When you and I think about it in time, will it ever come to an end? Will there be an end of time? Or can we go back in time with those questions we have of ourselves? But the theory of evolution, or excuse me, the theory of everything, that's why I put on there, we have a big toe. That's T-O-A, theory of everything. And so that's what it, it's a theoretical physics that gets to the point that we really have to think about because there are a lot of them that are theories that think about all of those possibilities of everything. So on this one, on this Sunday that we are now one Sunday removed from Easter, which we were celebrating last week and we've moved from that. And so we have the risen Christ positioned in our lives and positioned in our faith and positioned in where we are uh, of this post-resurrection and heavenly splendor of Christ. We think of it in that at times. And if you look at those verses that you just heard read to you, every eye will see this happen and all the tribes of the earth will wail when we think about what's happening to the end of the world. But with Jesus to you and me is really and truly a summer gift theory of, of everything. He's there. He's our big toe. He's the one that has the answers for us in all of this. And in him, all history comes together. When you realize that because of Jesus, our current reality, you realize our dates are set according to his birth. And so he has control in our, our lives with us without us realizing it. But Jesus was the one that explained to all of us through a single model of theories of all fundamental interactions of nature. He's the one that explains that to us when he talks about what happens between him and the Father and between him and us. And we look at those things. So he was the one that said who is, who was, and who is to come. He said that himself. And we've heard it read in several places. 
that we think of. But the rubric for us in our things, our pattern, or our, our um, start, or our purpose that we have in life, that are what we're about, is sort of our, an actual president of glory. When you realize life is that to us. And so when we look at today and we think about what's happening in our lives, and what is the theory of everything, and everything comes under the ruling and the control of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ. And then, that is our rubric because we think of who he is, who was, and who is to come. He, there, who he is? Jesus is what He always was and has been. In other words, Jesus plunged into our humanity and did not in any way diminish who He had always been. He didn't get diminished, even though he did plunge into our world. And so therefore, when we think about him, Jesus is at the very at this very moment alive. Well, like sure, he doesn't have a body like we have a body. He doesn't have a body like he had when he walked on this earth, but he, he's alive, and the body that Jesus has today is quite different from what it was when he when he was seen by everybody and was in his ministry on earth. And so the body is quite different. And if you don't think about that, go and read John the 20th chapter and you will find something about it. And also Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians about how he was, remember how he said to Mary, when Mary's family mentioned it, he says, don't touch me because I haven't ascended yet. That means my body that is you're going to touch is not what you think about. So when you realize what that little phrase happens in our lives, so I get to asking myself, and I'm sure you do too, who is Jesus? He's a real person. That's one thing that we know about. And who is alive with a sp spiritual body, a body like we can't imagine today. I think about it at times. He's not a dead person. I don't care what we used to say years ago when we talked about God is dead. Y'all, Some of you are not old enough to remember when that was going through the churches back in the, back in the 1960s and 70s and when we were arguing about whether he was there. He's not dead. He's not a a stone figure that's been chiseled by some sculpture. He's not even an image that you and I see as a holy icon sitting in a window somewhere. That's not where he is. He's not only a simple character portrayed in all the gospel. He's more than all of that that we find and see. He is. He exists. That's important for us to know today. He's real. He's as real as they come. And we've got all sorts of, of, of adjectives we can talk about him. I was reading one author and he listed them, and I'm going to throw some of them out to you for you to think about it. He's real. He's viable. He's alive. He's contemporary. He's among us. He's present and aware of all things. He's community. He's responsive. And he's reactive in all of this. So when you think about it, that's really true about him. He is present in the midst of this com cosmic con uh, continuum that we have in our lives today. And so the basic thing for you and me to understand is that he is the basis for the theory of everything. He's our big toe. He's important for us. And that Jesus is, you know, what he is explains why we have this purpose. Why do you think you pray? How many times do you pray to him? You see, that's part of it. He's part of us. He is. He explains that. And so we pray to him and we pray uh, in his name. And as a matter of fact, if you listen to the to all of us, that when we have a prayer, we kindly close it out. It says, in the name of Jesus, amen. We, we ask that prayer. Or because he is, you and I have a legitimate reason for us to thank and to praise him and, and worship him. That's why we're here this morning, is because of him being here. And so that's it. So we don't, you know, we would not do, you know, none of the things that you and I have done in our lives are there if it had not been for Jesus being in our lives. And so when you think about it, Jesus is. That's important for us to know today. And also we have to know that he was. He was here and think about it. The same Jesus who existed in space and in time in all the historical realities of 2,000 years ago when he was, a, you realize what he, when he was born from a young woman in Nazareth and in Galilee, he was given a name of Jesus. He was a, he was a baby, he was a toddler, he was a, probably a precocious teenager. Uh, think about it. And, and sharing his views to, 
the priest, remember, reading when he was 12 years old, he was talking to the priest, and they couldn't find him. Mother and father couldn't find him. So you got to realize he was, rather, he was a rather precocious teen, or a preteen anyway, and he was there. And later, think about it, he was a man with a mission. He was called to Christ, the Messiah. And that's been ringing in my head for quite a while. If you read my morning blog, I, had, I wrote a little bit about Handel and his Messiah that he wrote, and how he wrote it in 23 days. And think about it. Many of us that have sung it think about that thick book, and he wrote that in 23 days. You know? When you think about the marvelous part of it, but he had, he had a mission, just like Christ had a mission in his life. And so sometimes critics at times, when we get a little critical about it. We're having a lot of crisis in the church today, criticizing certain things and arguing about what's right and what isn't. But the wonderful thing is we want to know that Jesus is and Jesus was, and being that was, he's part of us. You know, yeah, we have problems with all the archaeological uh, witnesses, our evidence that we may have, there's not enough. And we think about it, well, you don't have enough to know that he was here. How are you gonna prove it? Because people argue about it. But I was reading an author, by the way, by the way, he's a notorious atheist, and he was also, but it was so funny, being a notorious atheist, he's also professor of religious studies at the University of North Carolina. Here he is, an atheist, but it's hard. But his name is Bart Ehrman. But he makes a wonderful comment about Jesus was and thinking about all the archaeological evidence that's not there. And here's what he says. The reality is that we don't have archaeological records of virtually anyone who lived in Jesus' time and place. The lack of evidence does not mean a person at the time didn't exist, right? It means that he or she, like 99.99% of the rest of the world at that time, made no impact on the archaeological records of that time. So what he's saying is, we have evidence, but we don't have to think about having the proof. But people argue, say, well, there's no archaeological evidence that he was here. But he was. And the other thing, he not only is and was, but he, he is to come. And that's really and truly what there's the old Latin word for it, articulum de five, which really means the article of our faith is what it amounts to. That's where we are. Jesus, I, I get to thinking about it. I like to think about what he did. Can you imagine in today's term, imagine what he did. There he was on that, uh, he, he made a lift off. A lot of like a rocket liftoff on that Galilean plains on his launch pad back in AD 20 or 29 or 30. And here he is coming again. And we think that he's, he is to come. And so the brief has to, belief has to be for us that over two millennia, Jesus is, he was, and he most definitely is coming again. And if you listen and read the book of Revelation, which by the way it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, as John wrote it and said it. You've got to realize when this was written. It was written about in the, in the 90s, AD, you know, the first century. And by the time there was, uh, Domitian was the ruler of Rome. He was, he was a despotic type of ruler. He wanted everybody to worship him. Jews and Christians were having a horrible time during his reign because they were being punished. And so we have all of this wonderful information but we also find out from people like Eusebius, who are heavily persecuted, he tells us what went on under Domitian. But the, one of the great things about it, you read the book of, of Revelation, and you take it in the Greek, which some of us had to go through when we were in the seminary. Thank goodness I don't have to read it that way today, but it was painful. The word overcome in Greek is used more and more in the book of Revelation about overcoming what was happening in life at that time. And so we have this, uh, it was sort of like, it was a helpful word for to the church as John was writing this and passing it out to, for everybody to keep their hands on the plow and keep looking straight ahead and keep their eyes on the prize and remember that a time of reckoning is at hand and so it was coming. And so the voice that we hear as we hear read from the book of Revelation that is read this morning, the voice of an exalted Christ who sits now at the throne at the right hand of the Father. 
And you've got to realize what he's doing sitting there. He's exhorting us, the church, today to remain faithful in times. Imagine what, what's happening to our church today. You realize what's happening across the world to Christian churches today. We're in all sorts of disarray. And we have all sorts of things that are causing us to suffer. And people are trying to push us out. Because we've got to think about something. Through it all, he's coming back. And we, one writer said, he's coming soon. Now, I don't know what soon means, all right? But it may be tomorrow, it may be many, many years down the road, but that was what he was saying, and I thought about it. But you and I think about it. You and I live in a world today where knowledge is power, isn't it? And yet no one can know everything there is to know. Even though many of you read William Barclay's, I mean, uh, William F. Buckley, y'all read him. He was the one that said, the one person that knew everything was Erasmus of Rottenburg. Uh, he did it with tongue in cheek. But it's also possible that those who have a theory of everything are limited, maybe limited to a few denizens that are in some university lab doing studies that are think tanks and all or research facilities. But I get to thinking about it when you get into the get to be spooky lab at times. But it's, if you and I ask about our theory of everything, it's a very plausible response for us to turn to the book of Revelation. If you want to look for the theory of everything, it's look to Revelation. I knew the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you go and read that eighth verse again, that in that first chapter that was read, or go and read Hebrews 13, 8, and you hear these words, I am the Alpha and the Omega coming from Christ said that, and that's what he was saying to us, says the Lord God. And then Hebrew records some other words for us, is who is the same yesterday, and today, and forever. He's not going to change. Who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. And so today, one Sunday removed from Easter, we get to thinking about this. Christ is the beginning. Christ is the ending. Christ is the Lord God. He is. He was. He's coming again. And he's the Almighty. Christ is our big theory of everything. And he wants us to know it. That's why he says, I is, who was, and who is to come. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Let's be standing for our hymn singing the score. Read on the breath of God.
table? Well, even if you do, and if you don't, introduce yourself and say to each other, I love you, and there's not a thing you can do about it. In God's name we pray and offer to him, Almighty God, we thank your blessings of this day. Bless us as we leave this place and go forward in your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can say that to her a lot.